Thank you for the opportunity to speak about We Hope for Better Things as part of the virtual Michigan Notable Book Tour. For this presentation, I would like to tell you a little bit about why I chose to write a book set in and around Detroit, a city which I have never lived in, uh, but which is close to my heart. And I also want to talk a bit about our current cultural moment as it relates to the themes of the book, specifically those regarding the history of race relations in America. We Hope for Better Things is set in Detroit. Both of my parents are from Detroit or around Detroit, and I grew up visiting grandparents and other family in the area. My buttoned up, long widowed paternal grandmother lived in a condo in Bloomfield Hills, which she bought with cash on Mother's Day of 1970. At her house, my sister and I swam in the condo association's pool, and we almost always had it to ourselves. We also traipsed around a gazebo, which was also always empty. On the rare occasion there were other kids to play with, uh, other people's grandchildren, I suppose, they were white, and I don't remember any of them. My maternal grandparents were more blue collar. They lived on the west side of Detroit, very west side, almost to Redford, not far from River Rouge Park. At their house, I picked lots of dandelions in the tiny scraggly yard, and I made forts in the gravel driveway with a bunch of junk that my hoarder grandfather kept in the basement. Organized, very well organized junk, but junk nonetheless. Um, just down that street, West Parkway, was the first time I ever played with black children. I was about five or six years old at the time, and it was a girl and her older brother. And not much remains of that memory now, except that both of their names started with K. And at one point, the brother was pouring water back and forth between two plastic cups, making a potion. Um, as a child, I was a true believer. I believed in magic. I believed that if I could find the right closet at the right time, I would surely make it into Narnia. I was pretty sure unicorns were real, and I believed that animals could talk to each other, and probably I would one day discover that I could talk to them as well. And I remember very uh, trying very hard to figure out how he was making this potion when he wasn't adding anything to it. He was just water back and forth between two cups saying some magic words. He seemed to possess some knowledge or skill that eluded me. He didn't show me how to do it. And later when I tried to do it at home by myself, it was still ordinary water. It just kept getting warmer and warmer and kind of gross. Uh, no matter how many times I poured it from one cup to the other. Another first in Detroit. Detroit Zoo was the first place that I ever saw someone give someone else the finger. Uh, we were on the train, the little zoo train, and I heard my mother say, oh, that's nice. And I looked where she was looking and I said, what? because I didn't understand the gesture. I don't remember how she explained it to me. She may have ignored it. Uh, but I did get the distinct impression that the person we were looking at was different than us in some way, because our family didn't make that gesture. And even though my mother would have sarcastically said, oh, that's nice, no matter how no matter who had flipped the bird in front of her children, uh, I know that in some way that gesture and the color of that kid's skin were intertwined in the young recesses of my mind because that kid was black. It was just another thing that seemed different from us. And that's how easy it is to make a false impression that can turn into an implicit bias or a prejudice later in life. A confluence of events, a child's mind trying to make sense of what's going on around them, and an association is created. Black kids are mysterious. Black kids are rebellious. Maybe they're just a little bit dangerous. Now, as a student of history, I have always been deeply interested in cause and effect, in how events are connected, and how movements arise and wars begin and end. I don't want to know what happened so much as I want to know why it happened. And that desire translates to our current reality. When we watch the news or see footage shared on social media, we see what happened from a particular angle, from a particular perspective. 
Just as a photographer composes a picture by excluding certain things and including other things, uh, we get one person's view of what happened when we see one of those videos. And when you have an event that has multiple video angles, you can get very different stories from different people. So if you see footage of people breaking windows or setting things on fire, we're seeing a what? We see a riot. And you can have a reaction to it based on your values and experiences that are different from others. One person will see irrational destruction of property. Another person will see people who feel they have no other way to be heard. And the thing is, in some way, they're both right. And we can stop there and do no more work and just wonder what's going on. Or we can start asking why. Why are these people angry? Why do they feel like they haven't been heard? You can start looking for understanding even when you don't approve of someone's actions. We are clearly living in a time of racial unrest. And honestly, I think we've been living in that time from the very beginning of this uh, country and before that. Uh, but today we see a lot of people questioning the status quo who maybe didn't even know the status quo was there before. We wonder why we're stuck in these old destructive patterns. And I wanna talk a little bit about racial unrest because that's a huge theme in We Hope for Better Things. Going through school, I became more aware of the history of race relations in our country. And I learned about what seemed to me to be two very different methods, uh, approaches to resistance. The peaceful protest movement of people like Martin Luther King Jr and the more militant and sometimes violent protests of people who followed other black leaders like the Black Panthers or Malcolm X. Now, one of these methods was clearly put forth as the preferred method, and I bet you can guess which one. We've seen both recently, peaceful protests and violent protests. And we've seen it this, in this country and all over the world. And as I think about it now, I can't help but pair those two methods up with those two first encounters I had with black children. One a little mysterious, one a little dangerous. One trying to make something special from something ordinary, saying some magic words. And if you listen to the way Dr. King spoke in that slow, deliberate preaching cadence, it feels a little like he's casting a spell. Just as I believed that the boy down the street had performed a great change in the substance he was working with, I believed that Dr. King had changed America. But I grew up in the 1990s, which were the pinnacle of political correctness. I lived in a small 99% white town. I never ran into interracial unrest in my life, and I was taught that the peaceful protest movement made big changes in America. And it did, but it didn't fix everything. But in my mind, it seemed like it had. Uh, and when people brought up race during the O.J. Simpson trial, I thought they were crazy. We were beyond this. Racism was something in black and white photos. And I grew up in color. I grew up with color TV, and I wonder if perhaps people in my generation, sort of end of Generation X, whose entire existence was the first to be record recorded only in color, was maybe one of the first generations to feel absolutely so distant from history because we were never photographed in black and white. That was then, and this is now. But at some point, I realized that what William Faulkner said is true. The past is never dead, it's not even past. Those photos that felt so distant to me could have been taken by my own father, who was a hobbyist photographer in the 1960s and took a lot of beautiful black and white photos. And at some point, I began thinking of that other method of resistance to oppression, the one that was always presented as the wrong way, the way that was not polite, the way that was relying more on actions and less on words the way that was fed up and flipping the bird and ready to fight back. I began to wonder 
if I were in that time and I were in that situation, who would I really be following? Dr. King or Malcolm X? I began to wonder if some of the things I was always kind of judgmental about were things that I could actually understand and even sympathize with. Maybe they were merely natural effects of a cause or a whole string of causes. At some point when words failed, was an act of violence inevitable, even necessary? That's how wars start. Diplomacy fails and things start blowing up. And we hope for better things. I wanted to take this huge topic, the history of race relations between black and white in this country, and look at it through the lens of one white Midwestern family, specifically through the eyes of three women in three generations dealing with their three realities that are more similar than they are dissimilar. In these pages, we meet Elizabeth Balsam, a free press reporter who is tasked with returning a camera in a box of never before seen photographs of the 1967 Detroit riots. And she's supposed to return them to a great aunt that she didn't know she had, but she really wants the photos for herself to further her career. We meet Nora Balsam, Elizabeth's great aunt, and experience her story of falling in love with the right man in the wrong time and watch this interracial couple struggle through the minefield of 1960s Detroit. And we meet Mary Balsam, Nora's great-grandmother, whose abolitionist husband joined the Union Army, leaving her to run the farm and sending escaped slaves her way, effectively making their farmhouse a stop on the Underground Railroad. I wrote it from the perspective of white women because that's what I am. But I worked hard through research, conversations with black friends, and vetting the manuscript through four early black readers to faithfully and truthfully represent characters of color who make up about half of the rather large cast. And as I wrote, I strove to put myself fully in other people's shoes, no matter what the character was doing, no matter who they were or what their context, I wanted to write without judgment to let each character do or say what felt natural, what seemed right to them, even if they found themselves in situations where there were no good choices to be made. My goal was to allow a white reader to understand that kid who was flipping someone off at the Detroit Zoo, to imagine themselves as a young, frustrated black boy in the midst of a riot and consider what they would do and what they would feel if they were in that same situation to think about what they would tell their parents if they loved someone of a different race, to consider how they might like to see themselves in the role of the white savior, but to also realize that such an attitude is destructive and harmful. And every lesson I hope a white reader learns is a lesson I learned myself in the process of writing this book. I didn't grow up in a racist home, but I did grow up in a white home, in a white town with white friends and white teachers. I needed to fill in the gaps of my own one-sided experience to realize that what was happening in all of those black and white photos was still happening in full color. And we've seen that reality on full display this year. It didn't come out of nowhere, just like the 67 riots didn't come out of nowhere. All it took was just a little bit of picking at the scab and it started to bleed again because the wound never healed. Now, the book isn't just for white people. <laughs> so what about a black reader? What do, they, what do I hope they take from this book? At the very least, I hope that in reading We Hope for Better Things, black readers find evidence that there are white folks struggling to reconcile the past and the present, who are working to rid themselves of implicit biases and prejudices, and who are working toward a better future, which does take a lot of hard work. It takes more than memes and more than changing our profile pictures to just black on social media. It takes a lot more than wishing. Um, we may wish that there's some magic potion that we could make that would fix things, but reconciliation is hard work and it takes work and pain and repentance. It's not a straight line and every generation, even one that grew up in full color, has to do the work. And for every reader, no matter what you look like, no matter what you've been through, 
No matter what you've done or left undone, I hope for better things. So this book is a very large scope book. It's a, a kind of an epic scope. It, it involves huge topics, uh, race relations, the Civil War, uh, the Detroit riots, very heavy stuff. And at the same time, uh, I find that it was kind of a, a intimate, character-driven uh, novel. And you chose to do it in a three-time period, three-timeline, interwoven kind of three stories situation. Uh, and I'm wondering, first of all, why you chose to do that. Secondly, how do you go about even preparing for something like this? Um, what kind of research did you have to do? And what was it that kind of drew you toward this sort of storytelling? So that's a lot of questions kind of wrapped together in one to get us going. But, sort of uh, like the book. Right, yeah. So I, I did that on purpose. Timeless. There you go. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Questions. Um, I, I don't think it, it was supposed to be that big of a book when I first started writing it or when I first had the idea um, because my initial idea didn't even involve race relations. So once, once though that kind of became part of the story, it became clear to me that I didn't just want to tell a story in the present day. I definitely wanted to tell a story um, set in Detroit at a particular time. And, and really when, when, when race became part of it, that almost determined the other timelines because I wanted to look at touch points such as the Civil War and the Civil Rights era and today and look at how things had changed, how things had not changed. And through this, this one family's view, the idea that from one generation to another, your family's legacy can change completely. Your family's um, way of interacting with people can change completely. And we don't all, a lot of us don't know a lot about our family history. And so I wanted to tell a story about one family and how they interacted with these very large, um, large scale issues in the country. And um, I told it from that perspective, partially because I wanted to learn about these different eras. So you mentioned research. I did a lot of research. I researched for an entire year, in fact, before I started writing the story. And I looked into the Civil War. I researched particular battles. I researched what women were doing uh, at home when people were at war. I researched very, very um, specific things about the Detroit riots, street by street stuff, what led to them, even though Detroit was one of the best places for African Americans to live in the 60s because they actually got paid a lot more there than anywhere else in the country um, because of the manufacturing in that area. Why then was there a riot? I wanted to know what was it about that city that became untenable. And there's a lot there's a lot. And only some of the research really makes it into the book because the story dictates what you say. So I had people ask me before, well, didn't you want to say something about this or that or these people? Um, but the story of these three women in these three timelines um, didn't cross paths with those things. So um, it, it is a really big topic, but I, I feel like most readers who I've talked to about it, they do talk about the characters. It's all about the characters. Um, about the people who they get to know in the pages. And that's how life is. We all, we learn about wars, we learn about these huge topics and we see them on TV, but people, individual people are going through all of those things. Um, and that's a more interesting story to me than figuring out, you know, times and dates and, you know, generals who were involved in war and all these different things. Um, it's always the why and, and how, how this person dealt with that reality. What form did your research take? Is it mostly thick tomes or? A lot I of mean, those. Okay. <laughs> a lot of thick tomes, uh, a lot of pages. And I'm somebody who likes physical books and I like writing in books. And so I've got a big box in the attic now of all the books and magazines and journal articles and things that um, were part of that research. I did listen to some podcasts as well. During the time that I was working on this book, the anniversary came around in 2017. The um, Well, maybe it was earlier than that that they were talking about the anniversary of the Detroit riots and um, what had changed since then and things like that. So a lot of new things came out at that time. You have a, 
a few movies that were made about the riots during that time. Um, so I did, I did a little bit of that and, you know, documentaries, things like that, but mostly it was reading. Yeah. Besides books and movies and things like that, I did also have the opportunity to speak to people who had lived in Detroit in the 1960s, specifically my parents. And my dad was a really great resource. He was somebody who I could ask any sort of question of where would black kids go to the movie theater versus white kids? Or what kind of car would this person drive? What would be the reaction to an interracial couple uh, walking down the street in Detroit? Uh, not the caricature we get of racism from the South in movies and things like that, but what did it look like up here? Okay. Uh, now, in addition to gleaning things from people that you interviewed and, and spoke with, are, is there any aspect of uh, an individual people you talked to that made it into the book as a character or a character mm. trait? Is anybody based on anybody? Is anyone based on you or is there anything autobiographical right. going on? <laughs> there's nobody based on me and there's actually nobody based on any real people that I know. There are people in the book, characters that have traits similar to, to other people or they have particular skills similar to other people. So. I quilt, I um, sew, my mother does alterations, my father does, uh, for, for a long time did hobbyist photography, and so all of those sorts of things make it into certain characters in the book, but nobody was actually based on anybody real, although there are a couple historical figures in the book that are certainly real. Now speaking of that, uh, historical fiction is tricky in that you have to accurately depict the the brunt of the history mm. but then you have to have this uh, kind of leeway um, and, and take poetic license I'm wondering uh, with all the research you did obviously there are aspects of this like uh, the riots themselves and the timeline of that uh, there's a speech that Dr. King gives in Detroit on a particular day uh, there's battles in the Civil War what are some other things that you uh, were very careful to be very accurate about well I was definitely accurate about um, you know, a lot of things change over the years. Street names change, neighborhood names change, um, the way people even talk about race changes, the way people have talked about the riots changes. It's called a rebellion now or an uprising in a lot of circles. I had a question from a, a person who was at an event asking, well, why did you call it a riot? Well, because that's what they called it. Mm -hmm. So you need to be accurate to the time that you're um, writing in. And that can cause issues, especially when you're writing about times when people used language that we didn't, we wouldn't mm -hmm. use today. Um, and it's, it's a little bit tricky because you want to be authentic, but you also want to be sensitive to readers. So it is kind of a balancing act. But there, there weren't any, um, any events that I felt constricted by. One of the nice things about historical fiction, but using not historical characters, is that you can do anything with the people you want. You just have to get the events right. So I felt a lot of freedom in that. The setting is very specific and the way that the, the house that, that kind of brings you through the entire, the three mm -hmm. timelines is described is very uh, kind of colorful and it's, it's quite clear that it's a, is it a real house? Is this? It's not a real house, but I, it is based oh. on a real house plan. I have a friend who's obsessed with architecture and houses and I found a plan from about when that house would be built. So it's accurate to the time. Um, and I, drew out the whole house. I put furniture in every room. So I knew exactly what it looked like in my head. And I think that helps with readers figuring out what it looks like. Um, but it's not based on a real house. There were a lot of houses um, in Michigan and other states that were involved in the Underground Railroad. This is not based on an actual house that was involved. Okay, so we're designing houses, <laughs> reading many, many books, uh, interviewing people. How how long a journey is this from <laughs> inception of the idea and kind of getting, you know, the cementing what it's going to be and then getting it written and then getting it into the hands of readers? Really long, really long process. Probably other people do it in a shorter time frame than I did, but it took me a long time. The initial idea was maybe 2010, 2011. Uh, by 2012, I kind of had the idea of, you know, where's the story going? It's going to be in three timelines. It's going to be involving race. It's going to be this family, all that. And then all of 2013, I just researched. 
wrote it in 2014 and then just started revising and continuously revising as I was looking for an agent and then as we were looking for a publisher and it finally hit shelves January 2019. So from the initial idea, it's almost nine years, but from when I actually started work on it, it's about seven years. And which is something you can do with a debut novel. Right. Uh, you've had two more books <laughs> you have less time in the later. timeline. Yeah, <laughs> since then, since January right. 2019. Um, it being your debut novel, were you expecting this to, to get the Michigan Notable Book Award? I wouldn't say I was expecting it, but I was hoping. I was strongly hoping because I am absolutely an ambassador for Michigan. I want people who live here to love it. I want people who don't live here to wish they lived here. Um, <laughs> I've had a blog for years where I talked about Michigan and I talked about um, travel in Michigan and I just love our state. And so I was really thrilled that it won. Now, this book is is uh, kind of going to keep coming back to people's mind as we continue to have things in the headlines. And very recently, there's been um, an awful lot of talk about uh, injustice, racial injustice, uh, especially surrounding the murder of George Floyd and, and a lot of stuff that kind of echoes what happened in the 60s, yeah. things that kind of remind us that it, we might feel like we've made an awful lot of progress, but maybe we haven't. Yeah. And how, I'm wondering, is this book being received in the midst of all that going on? Well, I know that people who have read it before all of that happened once it was kind of in the news and in people's news feeds, they did say, I can't stop thinking about we hope for better things because it was something to them that either it was something that awakened them to some of the things that they hadn't paid attention to before when it comes to racial inequity, or it was just, gosh, this is happening again. And it just keeps happening. Um, so I know that people who have read it, I think that that connection's easy to make. And for people who haven't read it, I'm, I'm hopeful that there will be more people who find through a piece of fiction, some new learning, some more understanding and more empathy, and then a way that they're gonna change in some way. Um, but I'm also really thrilled to see a lot of nonfiction by black authors, especially about this topic that have been around for a little while, all of a sudden coming up on the New York Times bestseller list. And it's, it's gratifying to see that um, people who wouldn't otherwise have paid attention to that are kind of waking up to it. Now, as you talk to people from all around, uh, obviously you're, you're getting different reactions from people with different uh, backgrounds. And that's a, a big part of being an author. Mm. Uh, and it's also part that right now is complicated yeah. uh, because when you promote a book, you want to go to a lot of libraries, you want to go to bookstores, especially you know independent bookstores. I think a lot of authors value that. Mm -hmm. How has the current situation complicated uh, your plans for promoting books and, and interacting with readers and, and getting yeah. word out there? Well, of course, I had a lot of events canceled, as a lot of authors did. I was so thankful that I wasn't debuting this year. I know a lot of writers who were. Um, but what we have done with a lot of those canceled events is started to reschedule them to be online events. A lot of libraries are doing this now, where they're having authors be live because they're in a Zoom room. It's not a recording. Um, and then the people who are taking part have an opportunity to ask questions afterwards. So you do get a little bit of the same sense as when you're at an event. Um, the one thing you don't get is the book table afterward where you can hear people's stories and, and interact with them and shake people's hands and sign books. So I really miss doing that and I'm hoping that that will start up again sometime maybe next year. Yeah, I think we all are. <laughs> um, <laughs> And speaking of next year and beyond, what what can we expect from you? What's what's in the works, and what are you hoping to to uh, bring to your readers? Uh, well, so we hope for better things came out in January of 2019. I did have a second book already come out uh, called The Words Between Us, and that came out in September of last year. And that is a story of a woman who is kind of running from her past. She's living under an assumed name. She owns a used bookstore. And uh, it's a back and forth in time story of how she came to that town when her parents were arrested and started living with a relative she didn't know she had um, and a life that she didn't know her parents had had before her. And she meets someone and is trying to cope with this 
a huge change in her life and they share classic novels with each other and that's kind of how their friendship grows and so anybody who enjoys classic literature or who suffered through English class in school should enjoy that and it's actually set in a fictionalized version of Bay City Michigan which is where the area where I grew up and um, I do have another book coming out in January of this coming year 2021 called All That We Carried and it's a sisterhood story sort of thing um, it's a story of two sisters who have been estranged for about 10 years. They haven't seen each other. They've barely talked. And they're going on a backcountry hike in the Porcupine Mountains. And they will not, um, they will not find it easy in any <laughs> shape or form, not physically, not emotionally, and not even spiritually, as they're coping with this shared tragedy that they had 10 years ago. Um, so many different things that they have to obstacles they have to surmount in in themselves and each other and in the world that they're hiking through because everything that can go wrong on a hiking trip sort of starts going wrong for them <laughs> but we certainly look forward to those books uh and and people are able to get the words between us now uh and also you're able to get michigan notable book award winner we hope for better things uh, by Aaron Bartles, and that is available anywhere books are sold.